The content of this video is for educational purposes. Any decision to revise one's clinical practice is the sole responsibility of the individual clinician. by saying that I have uh, no financial relationships to disclose. Uh, so this is cardiac critical care in, in 2020, and it probably looks very similar to your program. You'll notice right away that it uh, looks like it's 2 a.m. outside and it's dark. We have uh, a machine now just for a, just about every organ system in the body. We have our cardio help ECMO machine here. We have our distal perfuser flow monitor here. We have our next stage renal replacement therapy machine. We have ECOS catheters, it's, it's MGH, right? So we have our nitric oxide machine, we have the ventilators, we have uh, the infusion pumps, uh, but this is really where we are. And moving along to the next bed, again, looks very similar. Uh, we have CVVH, we have our Rotoflow ECMO machine, we have this time the CP Impella device, we have an echo machine, we have EEG. And you may ask, well, where is the patient in all this? Where are the patients here? Uh, kind of at the center of care. Uh, but this patient was actually with us for eight months. This is Mr. K. And he was in, believe it or not, ventricular fibrillation for most of that time on biventricular support. You can see he's kind of up and walking with the nurses. He has uh, an RVAD Centromag device. It may be a little hard to see on your screen, but it's dark going through his native lungs, which fortunately work well and then coming out of his LVAD Centromag device here on, on the right of your screen. But he's really preconditioning for an upcoming heart and kidney transplantation, but uh, also reanimating after a massive MI. And here he is visiting our uh, ether dome, uh, which many of you have seen. And uh, here he is looking out over the Longfellow Bridge with his wife. And as I was preparing these slides late last night, I thought, well, who is that there, that uh, resident with him in the ether dome? I said, oh, that's, that's uh, Dr. Jelly, uh, a resident, I believe at the time, uh, but even then interested in cardiac critical care medicine. And here he is uh, playing video games with uh, one of our nurses in the ICU. It's uh, probably a little hard to see on your screen, but he's actually in ventricular fibrillation uh, during this entire time. Uh, you'll notice right away that we use the soft restraints in our ICU to hold the uh, ECMO cannulas uh, to keep them off of the ground while he's up and walking. But uh, here he is doing his, his physical therapy in the morning. And this was a video clip that his wife uh, was kind enough to send me after a successful heart and kidney transplantation. And I had uh, the good fortune of seeing him uh, just about every month, obviously pre-COVID, uh, when he would come in uh, for, for routine visits. And I think the question then becomes when you see a story like this and you see the complexity, you know, what is the role of anesthesia intensivist in cardiac critical care medicine? Because it really has changed since uh, we started seeing the, the initial article from Dr. Hansen about critical care and anesthesiologist in critical care. And really what's changed is largely the complexity. We've gone from a place of uh, post-operative, uh, what you'll hear pathway patients or, or routine post-cardiac management, uh, valve, cabbage cases, to highly complex heart failure management. Uh, and on the cardiac medical side, you've seen patients uh, that have uh, essentially gone from pretty stable post-cath lab STEMIs to very complex mechanical circulatory support patients. And most of the heart failure patients now occupy many of those beds. So a lot of the patients are on some form of mechanical circulatory support. Uh, as you can see in the slides, they're on renal replacement therapy. Uh, it requires kind of advanced nursing care and the patients really do bounce around. They may start in the OR and then they end up in the cardiac surgical ICU and then they're in the medical ICU to the cath lab, to the EP lab, back to the floor, back to the unit. And so you, we get to know the patients quite well. And this is uh, not just a trend at our hospital. This is uh, essentially a national trend. If you look at Medicare data from 2003 to 2013, this was done by the group out of Michigan. Uh, what you'll see on the slide here on the right is that 
the, the routine kind of post STEMI management patient has really uh, disappeared from the cardiac ICUs. And now those patients are going directly to the floor. And uh, what you're seeing in terms of TAVR management, those patients are going to the PACU. And so what's really occupying that space? Well, they end up being these heart failure patients that come back in respiratory failure. Uh, they have complicated infections. They have GI bleeds. Uh, and that really has become what we're seeing in the cardiac ICU. And it's interesting now, if you look, most of the admissions are not cardiac admissions to a cardiac ICU. They're coming in, as I mentioned, with respiratory insufficiency. And now you're looking at a primary non-cardiac diagnosis being over 50% of what's being admitted to the ICUs. And uh, intensivists can really make a difference. Obviously, we know that in general ICU from the days of uh, Peter Pronovost and, and his work at Hopkins looking at general critical care, but the same is true when you look at cardiac critical care management. This is a, a study out of a program in Korea looking at over 2,500 cases. And what they're able to demonstrate over a three-year period is that they were able to really drive down mortality uh, when they introduce specialized cardiac critical care intensivists. And if you believe in the concept of failure to rescue, if your mortality in that program is high enough, you will see a difference when you introduce cardiac intensivists. And this is a, a popular topic, as you can imagine, in, in our units. Uh, I don't think anyone enjoys being in the hospital at night, uh, but if you have the right patient population, it does make a difference. We invited Glenn Whitman, who's the um, program director, but also the uh, medical director of the ICU at Hopkins. And he uh, was invited to give a commentary in JTCVS after a study that was done looking at nighttime coverage and in hospital coverage. And if you have the right patient population and your mortality, according to this study, is on average 5% uh, or higher, you can really start to see a difference in outcomes when you introduce in-house intensivists. And I, I included in this his quote and something he mentioned to us both uh, in person, but also in the paper, that intensivist stars do come out at night and they do improve outcomes, uh, at least in the cardiac surgery population. And if you look at this um, cartoon, this illustration by Dr. Katz at, at the Brigham, uh, they also are in the process of creating a cardiac critical care program. That's really the foundation for cardiac critical care. You have evolving comorbidity, comorbidity, you have increasing disease severity, you have greater susceptibility for critical illness. Many of these patients are multi-organ. And the next question becomes, well, how do you deliver care in a setting like this? How do you staff the unit? And then moving on to education, training, and research. And in 2014, we really changed our model. Um, and we combined, and many of you probably remember Blake 8 and Ellison 9 being very separate units, uh, both in terms of management and staffing. And we made an attempt to combine those units in uh, what we called a, a heart center ICU. And really this was an attempt to create a patient-centered care model over a clinical service model. Uh, and I think it fits uh, with what we see. Patients don't necessarily come in or admitted uh, with heart surgery. They come in with cardiac disease. Uh, over 40% of our patients now are inpatients that are being operated on. And so I think if you think of the way that units have been structured previously, we're uh, no longer siloed into single specialty units. It's not really the character of care that I think we provide. And it's hard to have a conversation about critical care without talking about uh, whether it's a closed unit or an open unit. And I would say we, we function as a closed unit, meaning our, our responding clinicians put in all of the orders and we round, but we do invite um, all of the team members. So the heart failure team, the lung transplant team to join us during rounds in the morning. And this is a lot of what Valentin Fuster ended up writing about in his commentary discussing the evolution of, of cardiac critical care medicine. And so when we started in 2014, we had uh, just a few intensivists, uh, three FTEs, and really we've now converted to a 16 intensivist program. And I think made that transition from a patient care service to a critical care program, really hitting on the hospital mission of not just patient care, but research, education, and community service. 
And I think what's unique about our program is that it is a, a cross-specialty program. We have uh, cardiac anesthesiologists that are also boarded in intensive care. We have general anesthesiologists, but with a strong interest in cardiac management in the ICU. We have cardiology intensivists, we have ED intensivists, and we've had now uh, two cardiac surgery intensivists uh, rotate through our program. And, and really the expectation, uh, because we work with medicine residents and surgical fellows, uh, advanced practitioners is that the attendings can manage everything in that 34 bed unit. So post-surgical management, uh, ECMO, MCS, we end up um, staffing all the heart and lung transplants, but also um, ACS, valvular disease, uh, ventricular dysrhythmias, that sort of thing. And really the focus of uh, what we published in anesthesiology uh, was I think all of the things that we can do as CT anesthesiologist in the ICU. Uh, we ended up taking over the uh, cardiac shock program in that we uh, receive all of the initial calls and then uh, start the communication with the heart failure group. That was a, a call that initially uh, ended up uh, going to the heart failure program. And I think because we are in-house, uh, we understand the bed flow and we can see those patients initially. Uh, there was a decision by both groups to have that call directly go to the uh, intensivist in-house and then involve the team members that are needed. Uh, we've started, and I'll talk a little bit about this, a, a lot of um, the ECMO process in general, both the decision-making, but also the cannulation. We're available, obviously, for airway management, bronchoscopy, intubations, and I'll talk a little bit about point of care, echocardiography, and ultrasonography in our program. And of course, there's more. Um, so in addition to the consults, you can imagine a lot of this be becomes triage and bed management. Uh, when we hit COVID-19, it became a, a daily conversation with the hospital incident command centers where we uh, discuss what cases are coming in, uh, how to manage uh, patients that are being discussed from the outside hospital, uh, the close ops unit, uh, talking about rapid responses, long-term care rounds. So there's there's plenty to be done in the in the cardiac ICU, and it's nice to have data to prove that. So this is uh, our own kind of billing data, our our daily E and Ms, which largely come from. Uh, level one and, and level two critical care charges. And you can see from 2015 to 2019, our program re really took off and we were able to capture a lot of the work that was uh, being done at the bedside by the intensivists in, with both a, a daytime and a nighttime rounding process. And we're a, a very hands-on group too. So these are ICU procedures. Uh, so procedures done uh, in the ICU across the 34 beds. And we've gone from doing about 200 procedures to uh, 900 procedures. And um, uh, a lot of that becomes airway management and um, uh, bronchoscopy, central lines, all the things that you can expect to be doing in the ICU. And I think one question that often comes up and, and one of the challenges that uh, I certainly heard about in the beginning was uh, being able to have a system that can sustain itself. MGH is, is unique in that uh, each program, at least physician program, has uh, their own separate cost center. Uh, and so you, uh, you, you must show you the charges that you're generating. And, and a lot of the payments are obviously driven by the payer mix, which we don't have uh, control over. But I think one thing that we've been able to show in our program is that over four years, although we have not quite doubled the number of intensivists, and we have not quite doubled the number of FTEs, we've more than doubled the number of charges coming out of our program. And I think that's largely a reflection of, of how busy we are and the type of work that we're doing. And obviously, I think this is good as we try to attract anesthesiologists uh, into critical care, especially cardiac critical care medicine. There's, as I mentioned, plenty to do. And MGH has uh, a long history in ECMO management. And so this is actually a picture on the right uh, that I received from Warren Zapo and, and Lorenzo Bear. And believe it or not, they were doing, and I didn't know this, even though I trained here, they were doing ECMO in 1975 in the old RICU. And I think many uh, understand that Warren Zapo, or rather, yeah, Warren Zapo was 
uh, the very first person to do a, a real randomized prospective study on ECMO patients. And this was in 1979, and then fast forward to uh, 2020, and you're talking about ECMO for, for COVID-19. I'll um, go through what you see on the bottom here. This is a simulation put together by one of our cardiac anesthesiologists that's now currently the ECMO director of our program as of last week. And we've seen our ECMO numbers really shoot up. So from 2009 uh, to 2018, you can see uh, as the heart and lung transplant programs really expanded at MGH, a lot of um, post-cardiac arrest patients ended up on ECMO. Uh, a lot of that ended up coming to our, our ICU. And now uh, fast forward into 2020 and we have well over uh, 100 patients uh, that have been managed on ECMO in our program. And one of the challenges at, at the time as that program continued to grow was how do we field all of these calls? Because as a, as a quaternary center, we also take calls from outside hospitals. And so we were part of a, a program that created an app. And really this was a solution to the paging problem. It's very challenging to call both for, from in-house, but also from an outside hospital uh, to try to reach someone that's responsible for ECMO. And so what this allowed us to do was screen for appropriate candidates have those family conversations at the outside hospital before deciding to transfer and have, I think, uh, smart calls with um, uh, physicians, both in-house, but also at the outside hospital, talking about what would be an appropriate candidate and discussing uh, major and relative contraindications. And so really this is an example, I think, of using technology to provide better care and certainly uh, more effective care given uh, bed constraints. And uh, this app was, was used and now is part of a larger app uh, run partly through the medicine department. And so now every trainee on the medicine service has, uh, has they obviously they have, a, they have a smartphone, but they have an app, an ACLS app, and we're in the process of building into that a button that they can hit when they have kind of refractory shock where they can contact the on-call um, attending intensivist to have a discussion about ECMO and potential ECMO cannulation for those patients as well. And of course, then, then COVID happens uh, in, in the spring here after, after Biogen. And really what changed for us was there was um, an institutional push to uh, separate ICUs. And so one of our ICUs became a COVID ICU and the other ICU here uh, became a heart center ICU. Now, obviously we did have patients. Um, so patients that were on say VA ECMO that were still in our heart center ICU, but pri primary pulmonary uh, COVID patients were in, uh, in our, our second ICU. And the ECMO experience really changed with that. We were inundated with uh, a lot of calls that we had over a hundred consults in a short period of time. And immediately we created a, a small four person review panel. Um, it was essentially a Zoom or a FaceTime conversation. Uh, we had the ICU attending on call, the ICU director, the ECMO director, and someone from the cannulation team. And in a very short period of time, we cannulated over 18 patients here in our ICU. And we provided um, kind of a list of major contraindications, relative contraindications and eligibility uh, for patients both in-house and from the outside. Uh, we uh, took the opportunity to write some of this up and submitted it to critical care medicine. And, and uh, a lot of what you see if you read the editorial was that uh, we spent a lot of time on the phone, uh, kind of using the app, but having conversations uh, flipping prone, uh, repeating blood gases, that sort of thing to make sure that we were bringing in the right patients and not bringing in everybody. And we have an internal advances in uh, motion series and we discussed kind of the patients that we were putting on, um, the management primarily of, of VV ECMO for these patients, but also we did have patients with uh, VA uh, patients on VA ECMO for myocarditis that ended up in our program as well. And I think one of the big challenges at the time, obviously MGH is, is uh, a, a hospital that's separated uh, by departments. Uh, we don't have a, a critical care department like say the University of Pittsburgh, but really COVID-19 forced us all to work together 
uh, the, the MICU, the PICU, the NICU. And I think this became uh, very obvious when we started to talk about ECMO capability and how many circuits uh, we actually had in the hospital and how we should share those circuits in the hospital. And I think one of the unique things about cardiac critical care medicine is that uh, we do have the ability to reconfigure circuits and convert patients from, say, traditional ECMO to BIVADS. And, and, and now that we have the Protect device and the Impella device, if we can free up, say, an oxygenator or a heater or blender, we can then uh, give that circuit or, or put together a circuit for a different patient that truly needs it for primary pulmonary pathology. And we also started to work very closely with the perfusionist and uh, as uh, our operating rooms really slowed down. We used a lot of what was in the operating room too, the, the bio, the Medtronic bio console devices uh, that had been at that point used for livers and lungs. And as those programs slowed down, we started to discuss using those across the hospital as well. But really, I think uh, a lot of what we discussed was how to share circuits, how to share equipment ac across the hospital. And it actually played into respiratory therapy management and, and nursing management and how we could make the most out of what we had at the hospital at the time. And this is a, this is a slide, this is not a simulation. And I think you'll, you'll notice that again, it's, uh, it's critical care. So it looks like it's maybe 3 a.m. outside. We have our uh, CX-50 echo machine. I noticed as I was putting this together, we have our nurse here pushing amps of uh, bicarb. And we have uh, Jerome Crowley in, in the center here, who uh, is now our current uh, ICU ECMO director and was part of every, believe it or not, every ECMO cannulation during our, our initial surge. And he's working with uh, two of the fellows um, on uh, peripheral cannulation here. And uh, Jerome has done a lot now recently, uh, helping to create a, a simulator. So this is, again, a, a simulated session uh, that he's doing with um, the respiratory therapists, the perfusionists, the nurses, and fellows from the CT surgical side, uh, the ICU, and also uh, the attending intensivist group as well. And um, he helped uh, put together a video series, so a YouTube type series uh, going through kind of the, the basic kits that uh, we were using at the time. And I'll see if I can play the video clip here for you with the micropuncture kit. And uh, so at the time, I think the, the plan was to use the app or get in touch with uh, the attending intensivist. We would then have an internal conversation about candidacy, uh, depending on the, the type of ECMO that was being requested. We would involve uh, the MICU attending as well and, and members of the MICU team to make sure that the patients actually had an exit strategy and were appropriate candidates and then uh, uh, Jerome helped put together uh, this kind of simulation video uh, with the fellows and uh, kind of went through the, the cannulation process with the fellows. And really, I think this is uh, an example of the impact of technology. Obviously, this is an example of ECMO and, and ECMO really started to take off during the H1N1 uh, influenza epidemic in 2009. And then fast forward to 2020, we have COVID-19 and it, it really for us revolutionized critical care. And uh, you can see here ECMO in 1971. Obviously, we, uh, I just showed an example of ECMO in 1975, and, and now with the cardio help device, you have kind of ECMO on a stick or ECMO with a, with a chrome handle where you can actually walk the patients around. And if you're interested in the role of the intensivist, especially within ECMO, both the initiation and the management, I think it's certainly worth reading uh, this um, paper by uh, Dan Brody in New York, where as part of a, a position paper, he talks about the role of the intensivist. And this was a part of um, a publication through the SCCM. Uh, another area of uh, our program that we were quite proud of was uh, rescue echocardiography uh, during COVID-19 and our MGH experience. And one of the challenges at the time, uh, obviously we wanted to minimize the amount of PPE that was being used, minimize the time in the room. Uh, we wanted to have the, the providers if possible that were already in the room doing the exam and, 
and Aranya Bagchi, who's one of our intensivists, uh, helped to create a centralized point of care ultrasound service for MGH. And we moved away uh, during our initial surge from the IE33 and the CX50 machine and started using these kind of handheld echo devices. And uh, what uh, our group really worked to create uh, with uh, other intensivists in the hospital was a way to then uh, feed those loops, uh, the ultrasound or echo loops into the central MGH system uh, so that everyone can review them and they then became uh, part of the EPIC system uh, for everyone to review. And in many of these cases, uh, the patients did not need a follow-up comprehensive uh, TTE exam. And we were able to use a lot of what was uh, already saved by the intensivist in the ICUs already during their normal physical exams. And uh, I wanted to share a lot of uh, what we created with rescue echocardiography I actually started with uh, one of your attendings. So Genevieve Stout, she was part of um, a program to help develop a rescue echo protocol uh, here at MGH uh, probably five years ago now, and primarily looking at non-cardiac surgical patients. And, and in it, uh, what she helped to create was a, a five exam sequence series uh, really looking at different circulatory states of shock. And the idea being that you don't need all 20 views when you're doing a rescue echo. And, and from this, she was able to uh, actually increase the number of um, consults that we received. And, and this was a simple program in that it started with just a pager at that time. And several of you probably remember this system. It, there was a Metavision system uh, we were able to create a button, and so any uh, OR provider could hit the button, or anesthesia provider could hit the button and then call for an echo. And that's now been transitioned to a vocera system, which is a walkie-talkie system. But uh, at that time, we really saw our number of rescue echo consults go up from 2015 and all the way through 2017. Uh, and I think that really helped us create a lot of what we did um, during COVID-19 in terms of uh, obtaining just simple views to rule out different forms of circulatory shock. Uh, that protocol that Genevieve helped create uh, was then later picked up by uh, future fellows and uh, especially the liver transplant group then used a lot of uh, what she created uh, to create uh, a focused liver transplant echo protocol as well. And we used that same protocol and uh, looked at all of the echoes across our heart center ICU, so across all 34 beds, and looked at the number of echoes that were actually done by intensivists to see did they, did they change management and how many were we actually doing, how many were TTE, how many were TEE, uh, how many were done off hours. And what we were able to show in that uh, review is that in a course of two years, we ended up performing almost 200 exams, so 189 exams. And it's, a, it's an ICU, so many of them were done with TTE, but 19%, so close to 20% of the exams were actually TEEs. And you can imagine these are patients with open chests, uh, fresh sternotomies, uh, mediastinal drains, so difficulty obtaining TTE views. But not surprisingly, many of them were done off hours, so between uh, 5 p.m. and 7 a.m. or on weekends or holidays, 54% of those exams led to an intervention in less than 30 minutes, either back to the OR for, say, tamponade, uh, to the cath lab for ECG changes, medical treatment changes. 48% uh, were performed for primary hypotension. And, and I think this is a reflection of our program. Now, 42% of those exams were already, were done on patients that were already on some form of mechanical circulatory support, whether it be an Impella device or ECMO. And I think that's really the, the, the ICU patient that we're seeing now. And so we've obviously invested a lot here in our program in rescue echocardiography. Uh, and it was nice uh, last year to see that the National Board of Echocardiography now offers an examination. So similar to the advanced TEE exam that you would take as a cardiac anesthesiologist, they now offer an exam primarily for intensivists. And uh, I think what we're hoping to do is have all of our fellows take this exam, our ICU fellows. And I'd certainly encourage all of our attending intensivists to take this exam also. And I think what we will start to see, and this was uh, this is a clinical trial by the group um, 
at Penn, and obviously they've done a lot of work with mobile ECMO, and we've uh, reached out to them to hopefully make this a multi-centered trial, but imagine doing rescue TEE in the in-hospital setting for all cardiac arrests. Obviously you would need a program or an, or an infrastructure to do something like this. Uh, but I think we are at the stage of being able to do well-controlled studies now for rescue, uh, rescue echocardiography. Uh, and so I was asked, I think at this point to uh, show this slide, I, uh, I'm not receiving anything from this, but I, I think you need to, to send a text to receive your, your CME credit, uh, according to Brooke here. Uh, and so I think moving along as you think about um, what you would need to create a program, obviously there's care delivery and there's management and, and that's uh, a, a primary for the hospital, but also I think we have a responsibility in terms of education and training and obviously research. And as we think about kind of our training, uh, you can see this is certainly pre-COVID. We have a, a summer student with us also interested in echocardiography and she used echocardiography as a tool to improve cardiac critical care health literacy and uh, assessed retention uh, after the surgery, uh, after showing these uh, patients their echo loops and, and discussing medical management and that sort of thing. And uh, now with the ability to, to walk a, a laptop into the room, she was able to go over their echo loops, both uh, pre and post-op. And then uh, fast forward uh, through COVID, uh, I don't think anyone knew what, what Zoom was at the time, but now everyone's on, on Zoom and people are logging in from uh, various locations in the hospital. Um, I'll try to play this video clip, what we have every morning. And I, I signed out of our conference this morning at, at 6.30, we review all of the chest X-rays in the heart center. Uh, both the fellows can log in, the CT surgical fellows can log in from the OR or wherever they are. Uh, the ICU fellows rotating through can, can log in uh, sometimes from home uh, as they're coming in. We have the intensivists uh, that uh, uh, run the, um, the conference and, and uh, we actually had our summer student logging in uh, from home. And so even uh, despite COVID, although we were not allowed to let uh, students in at the time in our ICU, he was able to still be a, a part of the program, uh, virtually at least. And he used this experience to talk about daily rounds with family. And essentially what he was able to do was host um, um, daily rounds and we would walk around with, uh, with an iPad and the families could be part of rounds and ask questions. And he helped set up uh, a lot of the family conferences afterwards. And um, Jonah Ludmere, one of our intensivists has an interest in family-centered care. And so he, uh, Paulo was still able to, to be part of our program as a summer student working on this project. And so I think we've done uh, a lot in terms of education. We have uh, now a lecture series. We have local grand rounds, so an ICU conference that happens now every month. We have residents um, from the anesthesia department, the medicine department. Uh, we have fellows, it feels like from, from all over that are interested in cardiac critical care medicine. We have uh, rotating fellows, clinical fellows, obviously, but also now research fellows. Um, and uh, we have a college shadowing experience now. We have an online curriculum that we've created that uh, rotating fellows can access or residents through a, a Dropbox account. And uh, th this past year, we um, invited, or we were approached rather by a group of health tech fellows. So some of them are clinical, some of them are MDs, some are, are PhDs, but it's a, a program that's established um, through HMS, the medical school, but also the engineering school and the business school. And they're looking for kind of viable business opportunities within the cardiac ICU. And it's a, a 10 month period where they, they round with us and, and think about ideas. So we have both obviously our clinical fellows, but we're now inviting non-clinical fellows to spend time with us, given all the, the technology and the bells and whistles in the hospital. And we, um, as I mentioned, we have now once a month, we invite one of the fellows that's rotating with us to present a case, an interesting case that they've seen in the ICU. Uh, we have the intensivist that was on, uh, be part of that call, or, or one of the heart failure doctors or one of the CT surgeons as well. 
And uh, many of these cases have uh, gone on uh, to be published as part of a, the case series, the CPC uh, report through the MGH. And, and these cases are kind of fascinating cases that have come through our ICU. Uh, we now host um, a two-day mechanical circulatory support course. Uh, and a lot of this was, um, came through the cardiac anesthesia program. Um, Mike Fitzsimons was running this course and it's really morphed into a bigger program, I think still um, using a lot of the cardiac anesthesiologists, but also intensivists uh, across the hospital now. And, and we invite interventionalists and heart failure staff as well uh, to give different lectures on mechanical circulatory support in the program. And uh, Aranya Bagchi and, and some of uh, the other intensivists in our group are now uh, part of a program where they're putting together hopefully a handbook. Obviously there are a lot of critical care handbooks, but there are not a lot of cardiac critical care handbooks, especially when you think about the management of VA ECMO and VV ECMO, hybrid VAV circuits, uh, post-cardiotomy shock, post-arrest and that sort of thing. And so I think there's a real opportunity uh, for intensivists to put together uh, handbooks like this for staff. And I think finally, um, in the last few minutes, we'll kind of head into the, the research side, which is certainly an exciting uh, part of the program for us now. Uh, we started with monthly meetings as part of a, a research platform. We talked about different projects that people were interested in, ongoing projects, funding. We invited the fellows to attend and we would pick um, an article and they would present as part of a journal club. Uh, our hope obviously through this and uh, Mike Silverman, one of the intensivists in our group is interested in uh, creating uh, a, a registry, kind of an outcomes data registry. He has a biobank interest and then an arm for clinical trials as well. And I think one of the challenges here at MGH, and I imagine it's similar at many programs, especially when talking about critical care medicine, is that the patients are coming from different um, uh, departments. They're coming from different parts of the hospital. And one of the challenges for us was that uh, we had some patients in the Ellison 9 ICU uh, that were approached about certain studies and then different um, uh, uh, researchers approaching the Blake 8 patients and then COC-6, which is the pre-op side. And so one of the conversations, at least early on, became how do we create a, a centralized research team um, so that everything kind of feeds through a, a primary group, recognizing that we are a cross-specialty and a cross-discipline group. Uh, many of you know Lorenzo Barra. He's um, uh, one of our star anesthesiologists, uh, an expert really in, in uh, pulmonary management and research. And he's very interested in heart-lung interactions. He's done a lot of work with uh, esophageal manometry, electrical impedance tomography, and more recently we've been using this uh, technology on patients with RVADs, with LVADs, on ECMO. And so this has become a, a fun part of the program. Uh, he has a big team of, of fellows, many of them from Italy, that rotate uh, through our ICUs now and are part of a couple trials that he's doing, uh, so, some of them with nitric oxide and some of them uh, looking at just uh, primary pulmonary pathology. And so this has been, a, I think, a great interaction with uh, a colleague in the anesthesia department. And I think the, the future state of, of uh, cardiac critical care medicine will probably look something like this. As I showed you in the beginning, we have a lot of devices, uh, but they don't always necessarily talk to each other. So we've invested here into um, a program or a, a device called a, a neuron. And this is uh, partly through a grant that's uh, through CRICO, which is our, our medical malpractice group. Uh, and we're looking at kind of post uh, um uh, arrests post-op, but also on the floor, but also in the ICU and looking to see, can we find predictors of adverse events? Uh, we've started the process now of installing um, this capsule device in all of our ICUs and uh, with Keon Safavi and the engineering group in the anesthesia department, they've started to track the data and, and develop kind of smart alerts for intensivists, both on Ellison 4, but also in our heart center ICU as well. 
uh, we're fortunate to have a lab and, and really the idea is that uh, if you can plug these devices into a single system, we can use the paging system or the text system now to alert physicians. And these would be smart alerts. So if the hemoglobin result is low or the blood gas uh, shows the patient to be acidotic, uh, rather than refreshing your, your Epic screen and, and uh, waiting for the result or waiting for someone to call up from the lab, this would be ideally a, a direct feed from the lab, but we also would have the ability uh, to set parameters uh, for patients in the ICU such that you would be alarmed about say a high transmembrane pressure gradient for a patient on ECMO or a low flow state for a, a distal perfuser. And these are the kind of the alerts that we're hoping to create with, with the help of Keon and, and uh, Janine and the engineering group here in our hospital. And this is a, a nice ex example of one, uh, one that uh, Keon gave us permission to share. And I'll try to play the clip. Um, the sound is, is not necessary, but what you'll see is um, so we have um, someone that's uh, on a ventilator and then uh, not a real patient, obviously, and then we'll disconnect uh, that patient from the ventilator and then we'll watch for our smart alert here. All right, so the patient say self extubated. And then if you look at the lower part of the screen, you can receive a, a phone call or a text message, you know, room 54, we have a event problem. And then you can um, set what you want to be alerted to. So this is, I think, probably the, the future of how we will be alerted to issues. Uh, and it's also nice when you think about patients as we run out of ICU space, patients that are on the floor in what we've created as, as close observation units as we start to look at potentially putting trach patients there, patients that are on low dose pressors in order to make the use out of the ICU beds that we do have, uh, perhaps there's a way to alert the responding clinicians or the house staff or the intensivists directly about alerts. And we have also included uh, our nursing director and the nurses as well, so that if they are outside of the room, uh, in addition to the central system, they can receive a, a personalized alert too. And I think the question really becomes, how do we use this, this data uh, to provide better care? Um, can we use it for risk predictions? And, and Aaron Aguirre, one of the intensivists in our program is quite interested in this. Can you improve outcomes? As, uh, can you uh, improve the care that you provide with these smart alerts as these patients become more complex and the monitoring uh, continues to be more complex? And a lot of uh, our work, fortunately, we've been able to uh, submit to various journals. And you can see one of the nice things about having a cross-specialty group is there are a lot of different interests from uh, dexmedetomidine and sedation studies. We've done EEG studies uh, to decision-making and uh, uh, the ethics committee. And I think it really just depends on the intensivist that you bring. And I think that's one of the values of having a, a cross-specialty intensivist group. And I think lastly, in, in the last uh, three minutes, uh, one of the things that we're hoping to do, and obviously we would like to be a hub really for critical care in New England. I think there's a real opportunity uh, for remote monitoring. If you think of all the things that you can do uh, with smart devices now and an opportunity for collaboration. And, and through COVID-19, we've been able to connect with a lot of the local hospitals and they have started to tell us about patients that we have. Uh, we've now been working. I think what's different this time is that there's uh, certainly a more established hospital system in terms of tr triage. Uh, I think pre-COVID, there were a lot of different ways to get into the hospital. And so uh, Peter Dunn and ho the hospital leadership are looking at kind of a central way to bring patients in. But in the background, uh, we've been able to form great relationships with a lot of the local hospitals and we get to know a lot of the intensivists locally and a lot of the fellows end up staying locally. So that's been one nice way for us to stay connected and still talk about patients locally. Um, we put together for the first time now a, a proposal and uh, this is a, a, we've had a very strong telehealth program in the hospital uh, for uh, neurology ICU. And so we put together something for cardiac uh, telehealth or what we're calling a teleheart ICU program. And we're starting with kind of um, some of the programs locally to see if they would be interested in partnering in a telehealth type of environment where we can uh, review cases and talk about cases that, cases that potentially need advanced 
uh, therapy. And we're fortunate, obviously, to have um, a phenomenal heart failure program, a lung transplant program. So for those patients uh, that have reached their limit in terms of what they can offer at, say, a smaller hospital, uh, not only are we able to learn about those patients sooner and talk about things that we're doing in trials, share protocols, uh, but we can talk about potentially transferring patients if we recognize early that this is a patient that would be a good candidate for a therapy that we can offer in our ICU. Um, as I mentioned, there are a few members of our group that are very interested in, in kind of mobile ECMO. Um, certainly uh, what's done at, at Penn, I think is phenomenal. And we're looking at some of the um, subsidiary hospitals uh, regionally to see if they would be interested in trying to set up a program where we could then go out or send out an, potentially an intensivist like uh, Dr. Crowley, uh, one of the fellows perhaps with a perfusionist and have the ability to cannulate at the outside hospital. Currently, uh, we do not offer that. We don't have a, a real infrastructure for that. And it is challenging to receive these calls from the outside hospital where they are talking about a patient uh, and you realize quickly they would be a great ECMO candidate, but you're worried about the transport itself if they don't have the ability to put the patient on ECMO at that smaller center. And again, this is uh, largely pre-COVID, but there are some um, other programs internationally that we've been able to collaborate with as well, smaller programs that have gone from 200 pump cases a year to 2,000 pump cases a year that are looking for uh, protocols and a, and a way to create a critical care program at their hospital. Um, and our, our former ECMO director, uh, Dr. Gaston Kudamis, was actually interested in some of the programs in the Dominican Republic as well, and a way to form a collaborations with those programs. And uh, just pre-COVID, we uh, were able to set up an observership uh, for uh, intensivists um, that were outside of the MGH system that were interested in spending two weeks with us to kind of shadow patients that are post-op, patients that come in as part of an arrest. And many of these programs have started to create their own um, uh, VAD programs, really uh, complex heart failure management programs, transplants, if that's an option. But they're also, I think, in a position where they're realizing a lot of the challenges end up being the, the post-op management and what to do with beds and how to, how to manage these patients and continue to move them through as the complexity goes up. And this was a, a fun program uh, through our hospital where uh, we're in the process of talking about a new building. I imagine, as, as you can imagine, everything is on hold now uh, given COVID. Uh, but we were discussing what does the, ICU, the ideal ICU look like uh, for the future of cardiac critical care? How do you position the beds? Uh, do you put a, a C arm in the ICU? Do you have a procedure room where you put the bathrooms, that sort of thing? And that was, uh, I have young kids at home and it felt like putting together uh, some of the Lego projects, but this was a fun project. And I think it, it shows that uh, cardiac critical care medicine is certainly here. Um, the hospital is interested in it. We have uh, very complex patients, and I think there's a real role for cardiac anesthesia intensivists and anesthesia intensivists in general in this field. And I'll share with you, this was the, the markup of, of what uh, we're hoping the hospital will look like uh, in a few years, where if you look on the front here at Cambridge Street, you'll see these kind of two towers here, and this would be uh, hopefully the home of, of uh, cardiac medicine here at MGH. Um, the original design had actually an entire floor, so upwards of 76 ICU beds uh, all together in kind of a heart center ICU model, so a, 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 a big investment in, in uh, cardiac medicine and cardiac critical care here. And uh, this is uh, what they tell me the building will look like. We'll see how many years this takes uh, to actually happen. Uh, but this would obviously be a great thing for our program. It'd be a great thing for our cardiac anesthesia group and uh, certainly our cardiac anesthesia intensivists as well. I think that's it. So thank you, Christina. Uh, Thanks, Ken. Um, I guess I'll open it up to any questions. Um, I'll, I'll start. Um, I think 
one of the pictures that you had at the beginning of, the, of your slides was very illustrative that we can keep people alive on innumerable machines. But I think one of the challenges we have, particularly as anesthesiologists, is setting limits to care. We're used to, one, not owning the patients, then they come to us and keeping them alive. What do you think the future role of anesthesia intensivists will be in terms of setting limits to appropriate care? No, I think that's a great question, uh, Christina. One of the things that changed early on for us after uh, a few Sentinel events was that um, for every ECMO cannulation now or any patient coming in on a device, there's an immediate, uh, what we call an OCC consult, which is the Optimum Care Committee, which is the new term for the Ethics Committee. And so I've certainly pushed to try to have uh, members of our team on that committee and anyone can join. We actually have respiratory therapists on that team. And so this is a group that will come around. The consult can be placed by any provider and they will come and, and leave a note and talk to the primary team and then set up a meeting with all the providers. Um, I think one of the unique things about our program, especially the, on the Ellison 9 side, is that our intensivists uh, do serve as the, as the attending of record for a lot of these patients that say come in through the ED. Uh, they're not part of an established program, so they're not coming in through heart failure or through cardiac surgery. And I think we do have a big role there to make sure that we do the same. And, and I've certainly been in that situation where you're, you really are pushing for someone, you meet them right away, you realize uh, quickly that, that they don't have a lot of connections in the facility. Um, they're not part of a program and, and you can really push, I think, with the connections that we have uh, with the cath lab and the surgeons. And we have people that are here because they want to help people. But I, I agree with you, I think it's equally important uh, to ask for outside help. And I think the ethics committee here has done a wonderful job of kind of resetting and making us all realize that there are limits to what we can provide. I think one of the worst things that, that we can do, especially in cardiac critical care medicine, uh, is, is create a situation where we have someone that's a bridge to nowhere, especially patients that are on some form of, some form of mechanical circulatory support. Uh, because the machines can still work and you may have a neurologically intact patient, but they, they don't have an exit strategy in terms of a, a transplant option or a durable device, let's say. Um, so I think it really does fall on us to make sure that we get the right people involved. Hey, Ken, this is Tony Hernandez. Uh, Christina, is it okay if I uh, jump in? Oh, yes, please. Yeah, uh, great talk. Uh, I know we have like two minutes left. Um, I, I noticed that you're using various different, the, the question involves echocardiography and specifically when you're using the various platforms, what, uh, what, what uh, platform are you using to uh, look at your images to archive, but really to, to sort of uh, document the rescue echo and these other images? Um, uh, lo looks like it would have to be a very nimble platform. Yeah, so I, that's one of the challenges that we've had initially is how to, how to load them all into the Epic system. So we've essentially saved them on, on, those, on the CX50 or the IE33 and, and used the, the, the internal system that, that we have in place, the Singo system. Uh, but one of the challenges is that it's, we created uh, these portable devices and, and uh, different people had uh, kind of their own handheld devices um, the, the, um, the larger group, the kind of echo group decided that we should try to have everything go through a Singo system. And the, the value of you is using Singo is that you could access those loops through Epic. Uh, so we've, uh, converted everything through Singo now as a way to try to, um, open the system up for everyone to access. But that, I agree with you. That was one of the big challenges. Um, the echo machines are purchased through different avenues and we have two different engineering teams. And I think uh, with the Lumify device uh, and the butterfly device now becoming popular and people wanting those images loaded too, that's been one of the, one of the challenges in, in making sure that, that everything that you send is safe also. Yeah, Thank but that's you. a great question. And I think we have time for one last question. And it's from the chat box from Dr. Blair. He says, what are the cognitive outcomes associated with the application of this advanced multi-organ support regimes? Yeah, I think, um, so for us, a, a lot of it depends on the, the exit strategy available. I think the, the if, if your question is about you know, when you see all of these devices, you know, what, what do the outcomes actually look like? 
I think it, it largely depends on the patients, what they're coming in for and what they have options for. Uh, many of these patients are coming in, say, through the cath lab or coming in as a rest. And for a very short period of time, they may be in profound cardiogenic shock, multi-organ failure. Uh, but we do have the ability uh, to support them during that time. And, and if, they're, if they're young and they have kind of no toxic habits and they're eligible for transplantation, I think we've really been able to save a, a lot of those patients. And, and many of these patients also, we get to know they're part of an established program, say the heart failure program or the lung program. And so when we hear about those patients coming in, we have a, a direct admit process right to the ICU so that hopefully we, we can jump on them early. And with the, the idea of a failure to rescue, I think the earlier we can intervene on those patients that we know have the ability to slide, certainly the better. And I think, you know, now that we're, we're part of the conversations with the heart failure group about uh, who, should, who should be listed, and, and we can really advocate for those patients early. So I, I think our outcomes, all things considered, are, are pretty good, uh, despite the complexity that you see in the slides. All right, we're all out of time, Kim. Thanks so much for joining us and sharing all the great work that you've done. Um, up at MGH, and I hope I wish you luck in the, what I'm sure will be the challenging weeks ahead, given what we're seeing um, here, certainly at Vanderbilt with COVID. All right, thank you so much, Christina. Thank you all. Good to see you, Warren. Thank you so much, Ken. Thank you.